Hello and welcome back to Neural Data Science. I'm Professor Aaron Newman. Today we're going to learn how to plot heat maps of spike train data in Matplotlib. So our learning objectives are to visualize spike train data along two dimensions using heat maps. We'll create a 2D NumPy array of histograms in order to generate this plot, and then we'll format the heat map, including adding a color bar as a legend for what the colors mean. And through this, we'll learn to understand a bit more about the process of interpolation and understand the advantages and disadvantages of different ways of interpolating. We'll also understand how color choice can influence the interpretation of heat maps and make well-reasoned choices about color map selection. So heat maps are another way of plotting spike train data. Here's an example of a heat map that we're going to be generating. And you can see that we have stimulus intensity along the y-axis and time along the x-axis. So the x-axis is the same as we've seen in our previous peristimulus time histograms. But what we've done now is put 10 peristimulus time histograms that were separate subplots in our previous lesson into one plot. And rather than using bar height to represent the number of spikes, we have a color scale. So if you look at the color bar over on the right, it's labeled mean spikes per time bin, and it goes from zero to 0 0.8. So it basically tells you the proportion of trials on which a spike occurred at a given time point for a given intensity level. So it's a very information rich way of representing the data. Heat maps really allow us to plot three dimensions of data rather than two. So one dimension is time on the x-axis, another dimension is stimulus intensity on the y-axis, and the third dimension is the spike rate, which is shown with color. So the third dimension is plotted using color. So to generate a heat map, we use a function in matplotlib called axe.imshow, where there's also a plt.imshow function to generate the heat map. So we're going to start by importing the packages we need. So import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. We're going to import numpy as np. And we're going to import pandas as pd. Next, we're going to load in the data from the same 10 intensities CSV file that we did in the last lesson. So spikes equals pd.read CSV data slash 10 intensities dot CSV. And we're going to find experimental parameters. So things we know about the experiment that will be useful, like the stimulus on time, which was four milliseconds stimulus off time, which was 14, number of trials, which is 10, the number of time points, which is 21, and the number of intensity levels that we have. The next thing that we're going to do is create histograms of the data prior to drawing the plot. In the last lesson, we were generating the histograms as plots right when we needed them. So we'd loop through, and for each intensity level, we would use a matplotlib.hist function to generate the histogram. Here, we need to generate the histograms for each intensity level first, and then combine them together in order to be able to plot them in one image. So what we're going to do is compute the histograms using the np histogram function, and we're going to save those in a NumPy array. Uh, so it'll be an array of histograms where each row is a different intensity level and the columns are all of the time bins for that uh, intensity level. We're going to start by doing this just for one intensity level so you can see how it works and then we'll scale it up in a loop to multiple intensity levels. So int lev equals 9. So now we'll run the np histogram function in order to calculate the histograms. And again, this function doesn't generate a plot of the histogram. It just computes the values that would be used to plot the histogram. So in other words, it's going to compute how many spikes are in each time bin. And it generates two outputs. One is the histogram itself, so that count in each bin. And the other is the bins, so the edges of the bins. So the first bin would go from 0 to 1 millisecond. So those would be the edges of that bin, 1 to 2, and so on and so on. So we need to assign those two outputs to two variables. So hist and bins equals np dot histogram. And we want to take the spikes data frame and in that select 
where spikes intensity is equal to our current intensity level and just select the spike time column comma after that and then we want to specify the number of bins so that's going to be equal to the number of time points we have which we hard coded up above and we also want to specify the range and that is going to go from zero to the number of time points we have to specify these two arguments here this is a little different from the way the histogram plotting worked the number of bins is how many bins are you going to use so we want 21 bins because we have those time points the range specifies the range of those bins and we need both of these because we want to ensure that we have number of bins equal to the number of data points that we measured data at so each time point but we also want to force the range to go of those bins to go from 0 to 21 and not just from the minimum spike time on a particular intensity level to the maximum spike time for that intensity level so we need both those arguments there and having done that we're just going to ask to see what's actually in the hist variable and what's in the bins variable so print histogram and then print out the actual hist and print histogram has and then we're going to convert the length of the histogram to a string we're going to say it has that many values just print a blank line and then we're going to print bin edges it's a number of bins we're going to print bins has again convert to a string the length of the bins and it has that many values so when we look at our output we see here's the histogram so it's a numpy array remember we can tell it's a numpy array because there's no commas it looks like a list but there's no commas and that tells us how many spikes are in each bin histogram has 21 values and then the bins are the bin edges and so here we have 22 values because again, the bins define the edges of each bin. So however many bins you have, you need that number of bins plus one edges because there's an edge on the right-hand side of all the bins and an edge on the left-hand side. So these go from zero to 21, which is 22 values. So just to show you how the np.histogram compares to the histogram plotting routine that we used previously, I'll run that one. So plt.hist and give it the same input so spikes where spikes intensity is equivalent to the current intensity level and just pull out the spike time column and the bins is equal to the number of time points and the range is equal to zero to the number of time points generate that plot and what's cool here is I didn't use plt.show at the end to hide all of kind of the extraneous text output that we usually don't want to see when we generate a plot and by not doing that I see that plot routine is actually showing me the histogram that it then plots so it shows you three zero 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 one etc which is the same as our histogram up here and then it also shows you the bins and it generates the plot so under the hood, when we run plot.hist or axe.hist, it's actually calling np-histogram. np-histogram feeds it the histogram and the bins, and the plot routine uses that to generate the plot. So it's really just sort of a shortcut using this plot routine to compute the histogram and plot all at once. In the current case, because we want to compute all our histograms first and then combine them together to generate the heat map, we do this histogram computation and plotting in two different steps. So now let's actually create the NumPy array of histograms for each intensity level. So to do this, we're going to say hist equals np.zeros. And what this does is it creates a NumPy array full of zeros that we can replace with other values later. With NumPy arrays, you want to create the array first as an empty array and then fill it with values. You don't want to sort of append rows to it each time. 
because that is incredibly slow with NumPy and very inefficient. So NP zeros, and then the argument, the first argument to NP zeros is the dimensions of the NumPy array that you want. So we're going to pass that as a list. So we want a number of rows equivalent to our number of intensities and the number of columns equivalent to the number of time points. And then we'll loop through for i in range of the number of intensities. So that'll go from zero up to the, the number of intensities. And we'll say hist, because hist is the numpy array that we created there. So we'll index that with i as the row index, and then colon, meaning we're going to fill all the columns with the output of this command and comma bins, because remember NP histogram generates the histogram and the bins as two separate things. Bins. NP dot histogram spikes where spikes intensity is equal to, actually before we used int level, now we'll just say I, and spike time. And again, we'll give it the bins is equal to the number of time points. And the range is equal to zero up to the number of time points. And we don't see a plot because we didn't ask for a plot. We just asked it to compute that histogram. So let's look at what's in this NumPy array of histograms now. So we'll just print out that array. And so we can see we've got rows corresponding to intensity levels, columns corresponding to time points, and the values in this array are just the number of spikes that occurred at that intensity level at that time point. So now that we have that, plotting it as a heat map is incredibly easy. We'll just say plt.mshow hist, plt.show for good measure. And I'll point out here that I'm using plt rather than the fig comma ax equals plt.subplots object-oriented plotting just because I'm not doing anything fancy with this plot right now. So it's quicker just to use the one line PLT version. Okay, so here's our heat map. And with plot imshow, basically imshow is a routine that's designed to plot 2D images. So any sort of NumPy array or any array of rows and columns, two dimensional basically, can be plotted as an image. And the values in there just determine the color levels. So you could actually use this to plot like an MRI image or even a, a JPEG photo or something like that. We're using our histogram data to do it. So we can see along the y-axis, zero is at the top, nine is at the bottom, which is a little unusual. We probably want to reverse that. There's a few things we're going to do to, to change this, obviously, because this doesn't look a lot like the heat map at the top of this lesson. You can see time on the x-axis, and you can see some bright yellow areas. Those are the highest number of spikes, as well as dark areas there. Okay, so that's our, our image of our many histograms, our heat map. But now let's uh, work on tweaking that, formatting it, and making it pretty the way we want it. So there's a few things that we want to do. We want to change the y-axis, so zero is at the bottom rather than the top which makes sense because Y usually goes from bottom to top. Imshow does things differently just because it's designed to work with image files where the first value would be the top of the image. The next thing we want to do is change the color map from that sort of blue, yellow kind of color map you saw above to the red and yellow and white and black uh, color map that you saw at the top, which is the hot color map. And we're going to change the interpolation argument that changes the mathematical formula that's used to determine the color values at each point in the plot. So the default method, which is anti-aliased or nearest neighbor is essentially the same thing, is going to generate what you saw up above. Let me scroll back. Where each data point generates a block in the image. So you kind of have a big pixel that corresponds to that intensity level and that time point. So it's literally representing each data point. Whereas at the top of the image, and again, let's scroll up, we see that instead of being blocky, it looks very smooth. So the interpolation has basically sort of connected the dots in between each data point that we have and made an inference or a guess about what the value there would be. So the image looks a lot smoother. 
So to do all that, we'll revert to our object-oriented plotting, first of all. So fig axe equals plt.subplots. Fig size equals 10 by 10, because we want a square heat map. So m show. So now we give it hist again as the input, but we're going to add some quarks. So one that we can use is the origin quarg, and we'll call that lower. So that will say that the, the origin on the y-axis is in the, the lower end of the axis rather than the top. We'll say cmap for color map is equal to hot. And we'll say interpolation is bilinear. Later we'll talk about different interpolation methods. So now I'm going to format my axes by specifying the ticks. So ax dot set x ticks, and we'll set that as a range going from 0 to the number of time points plus 1, just to add a bit of padding, and in steps of 2, and ax dot set y ticks, and we'll make that a range, and we'll just say num intensities. In the first one, I said zero, so I gave it three arguments, zero, num tp, plus one, and two, because I wanted to make the step size two. The step size is always the third argument, so you need to specify the first argument, so the start, the end, and the step. If you only give range one argument, it'll just go from zero to that value in steps of one, which is what I want for the y ticks, so I didn't have to use zero at the beginning there. And then we've got plot.show at the bottom, and there you have it. So now we have zero on the y-axis at the bottom. We've got ticks for every trial number. And we've got time in steps of two along the x-axis. Nice hot color map and bilinear interpolation, which means that it's, it's sort of smoother like that. Next thing we can do is label the axes so that we know what do those numbers mean. So let me copy and paste the code that we already have that's working nicely. And to that, we're going to add a couple of things, actually, besides just labels. We're also going to, right here, say axe.axeVline from at the stim on point. So we're going to draw vertical lines that basically show us when the stimulus came on and when it went off. We don't want to use shading the way we did in our previous plots because we're using color for a different purpose in the heat maps, which is to show the spike rate or the number of spikes. So we don't want to confuse that by overlaying a color on our color map. So we're going to draw one line at the time stim on. Color is white in this case. And the line style is going to be dashed. And we communicate dashed with two hyphens. Missed a quote along the way there. I'll do another dot ax dot ax v line at the stim off time. And you may notice that in previous plots, when we were doing raster plots, we used V-line and we passed it the set of tick marks. So I could have actually used axe.vline and in one line of code, put the stim on and stim off times as a list rather than using a separate line of code for each of my vertical lines. The difference between axe.vline and axe.axeVline is axeVline draws the line from the bottom of the axis to the top of the axis, whereas axe.vline, you have to give it the y minimum and y maximum values. So axeVline is for drawing shorter lines within a plot, whereas here we want the line to span the entire range of the plot. So we say axeVline and then we don't have to worry about specifying the minimum and maximum y values. And then as well as setting the x ticks, we're going to say axe.set x label. And we'll make that time in milliseconds. And under x set y ticks, we'll do axe.set y label. And we'll make that probability of spiking across density levels, maybe without the extra p. So there we have it. 
same heat map, but now we've got these dashed lines showing us when the stimulus was on and labels on our axes. So this is great, but we don't really know what these colors mean in the plot. So let's add a color bar, the legend that tells us what these mean. Again, we've got some nice working code here, so we'll copy that, paste it, and just type in the new bits. And in this case, the new bit is saying fig color bar IM. But where did IM come from? What's IM? So up above, I'm going to make one other change, which is that on my line where I ran axe.imshow, I'm going to actually assign the result of that plot to a new variable called IM for image. And what this is doing, it'll still generate the plot, but it'll take a, a pointer to that plot and save it in IM, which later means that I can use IM, refer to IM, and I'm referring to the plot itself. And this is something that the color bar routine in matplotlib needs. So I'm going to add some space here. And adding the color bar is a figure level uh, option for a plot, not an axis level option. So fig.colorbar. And the reason is that it's actually going to create a new subplot within my figure to hold the color bar. We don't have to explicitly tell it to create a new subplot. Color bar will do that for us, but it's a figure level option. And then the argument to that is I am. So basically what color bar is going to do is look at that pointer to I am. I am points to a stored space in memory where that the data for that plot, that imshow plot is. And color bar is going to look at that and look at the range of values of colors that are in the plot and use that to generate the color bar. So we don't have to give it options around the range of values. It'll do that automatically. So there we go. We get a color bar. It goes from 0 to 8, but it's huge, and we still don't know what those numbers mean. So we're going to clean that up in the next step. Copy my code, paste it in down below. So I'm going to do two things. First of all, I'm going to assign the result now of running the color bar command to a new variable called cb. So just like im was a pointer to the heat map, cb is a pointer to the color bar. And then I can run cb.axe.set y label spike probability. So we're referencing that color bar, which basically is the axis, the new axis or subplot that was created when I ran fig.color bar. And so we're saying CB on its axis, set the Y label, spike probability. The other thing to make the color bar not so huge is that there is a quark for the color bar called shrink. And we give it the portion of the original size that we want it to be. And it turns out that 0.33 works well for this plot. There. So now our color bar isn't bigger than the plot itself. And it has a label there, which is spike probability. Maybe that's not quite the right terminology because it's actually the count of spikes and not the probability. So we could say spike count. There we go. So now we have a heat map with a color bar that is not larger than the plot itself and a label so we know those numbers and the color values represent the number of spikes, the count of spikes. So the heat map makes a few interesting properties of the data immediately evident, maybe even more clearly and concisely than the 10 peristimulus time histograms in the previous lesson or the raster plots for that matter. So for example, it's clear that spiking increases with stimulus intensity so as we go from bottom to top of the plot, we can see that there's just a lot of black and a bit of red at the lower intensity levels, and then really hot yellow and even white activity up at the top. So it's clear that that uh, happens, especially sort of after seven milliseconds. And as it also kind of shows that there is a bit of a threshold effect, that it goes from nothing to something to, you know, sort of another step of really intense spiking activity. It also makes very clear the relationship we talked about before between the intensity of the light and the latency to first spike and the overall timing of when the peak number of spikes occur. So you can see kind of this diagonal line where it's black, so no spiking activity, and there's a longer latency to spiking at the lowest stimulus levels. And it does look like a pretty linear sort of relationship here 
where as the intensity gets higher, the latency to first spike gets shorter. Okay, so that's the part of the lesson that covers how we generate the heat maps. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about some considerations in how we display the heat maps. So one is the interpolation. Remember, I already talked about the fact that by default, the image show routine uses what's called anti-aliased or nearest neighbor interpolation, which basically just plots the data points you provide it with as big square pixels. Whereas when we used bilinear interpolation, that's when we got a nice smooth graph. And there's pluses and minuses to both. So the blocky one is a much more literal representation of the data, but we're actually in this experiment taking two continuous variables, time and intensity level, and discretizing them into set levels. So we have measurements every one millisecond. So we're categorizing time or discretizing time into one millisecond bins. And even if we had more fine-grained measurements of time, when we generate the histograms, we're specifying that our bins are one millisecond wide. So we're sort of making that discrete in that way. And likewise, light intensity could be any level at all in a continuous fashion, but we chose 10 discrete levels of intensity to use. So when we use bilinear interpolation, what we're doing is we're allowing the figure to represent what the probable values of the, in this case, the number of spikes would be in between, say, intensity level three and four, or in between time point 10 and time point 11. So it's a bit of a generalization from the actual data that we've measured, but it's a pretty reasonable one. And it also is nicer to look at. So we're gonna look at some code here and you don't even have to type this in, it's all provided for you, but I'll just sort of walk through it quickly. Basically, we're gonna generate a figure with four subplots and we're gonna show four different types of interpolation. So one is nearest neighbor, one is bilinear, one is Hanning, and one is bicubic. You don't even have to worry about what those interpolation methods are mathematically. We're just gonna run the cell and see what they look like. So nearest neighbor, very blocky. Bilinear is what we saw before, fairly smooth. Bicubic is even smoother and Hanning is kind of somewhere in between bicubic and nearest neighbor. So maybe a little more blocky than bicubic or even bilinear, but still smoothed relative to nearest neighbor. So these different methods, if you actually look into the math behind them, are clearly doing things differently. You may have particular reasons for choosing one or the other, bilinear or bicubic, for the kind of smooth continuous data that we have that's been discretized the way we did it, bilinear by cubic are good choices. A more important consideration maybe is the color map choice. And we've already talked about color in a previous lesson. And for example, the fact that people who are colorblind don't perceive color obviously in the same way as people who aren't colorblind. And so some color choices may make distinctions that you're trying to emphasize actually not visible to people with colorblindness. And, you know, in a group of 20 people, you're likely to have at least one who is colorblind. When we move to heat maps, these issues of color choice actually become a lot more important. And we don't even just have to worry about people who are colorblind. We have to worry about everybody in our heat map choices. So let's run this first cell here. And so now we've plotted our same heat map that we saw up above, but we're using a different color map called JET. And JET's kind of a rainbow color map. So you can see that there's blue areas, dark blue, light blue, sort of you know, lighter blue, cyan, green, yellow, orange. So whereas the other, the hot color map really just had a few hues, so it had red and yellow and white, basically, this one has a lot more. And our eyes and our brains perceive color categorically, meaning that even though light wavelength varies continuously, the colors that we see are a little more discrete. So we can kind of very clearly see here, there's dark blue, lighter blue, green, yellow, orange. So it looks like there's jumps in the number of spikes, right? So when we go from kind of dark blue to light blue, that's kind of a jump, but sort of a, a smallish jump. Probably you perceive the jump, like there's a sort of brighter band of light green and then a darker green by that. 
So that makes it look like there's a very discrete sort of change in the spike rate there. And likewise, when we go from green into yellow and especially into sort of the dark orange, that looks like another big step in spike rate. So even though the number of spikes is continuous, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., this heat map really makes it look like there's sort of big jumps that aren't actually present in the data. So your choice of color map is actually leading your brain to believe something other than what the data is actually telling it. So there's many colors, and another issue with this color map is it's not what we'd call isoluminant. Isoluminant means all of the different colors have the same luminance or the same brightness. But here, like I say, especially the sort of greenish cyan band here is much more luminant than like the blues down below. So it almost looks like a line there where it should be a more continuous thing. So one way to get around that is to use a monochromatic or single color scale. So here we're using a gray scale. So the color values go from zero to one, basically black to white through shades of gray. And now compared to that other one, it looks much more smooth and continuous. There's still sort of clearly a more intense area and a more dark area, but it doesn't look quite like there's so many jumps in spike rate. It looks a little more smooth and continuous. And that's more vertical or more accurate way of representing the data. It turns out you don't have to use just black and white or a monochromatic. You could make monochromatic red plots, for example, where it goes from dark red to white. You can use other color maps that are isoluminant, and Matplotlib provides you with a whole bunch of those. So like I say, choosing the wrong color map can mislead viewers into interpreting the data wrongly. So we want to pick a color map that is isoluminant, so all the brightness levels or sort of steps in brightness are the same, and that's perceptually uniform. So nearby values have similar appearing colors across the range. So there's a number of good color maps that are perceptually uniform and isoluminant. One family that I particularly like are the Veritas family of color maps. And we'll see these in this plot. So again, we're just plotting the same heat map now with the four different Veritas family color maps. One's actually called Veritas, one's called Plasma, one's called Magna, and one's called Inferno. So slightly different color choices but they're all isoluminant and they all meet that perceptually uniform criteria that I talked about above. So they do look a little more smooth and continuous compared to say the jet color map with the blue, green, yellow, orange kind of thing. And, you know, quite pretty to my eye. Down below, I'm gonna plot again, but using four less appropriate color maps for this kind of situation. So in the red, blue color map, the scale goes from dark red through lighter reds to white. And then once it goes through white, it goes into light blue and then dark blue. This can be really good if you want to represent negative values with one color and positive values with another. So red could be positive and blue could be negative. And then the intensity or the darkness of the red or the blue indicates is it closer to zero or farther from zero. And zero would be represented as white. In this case, we're representing values from zero to eight. And so it doesn't make sense. Basically white in this case would be four. So it doesn't really make sense to make a value of four white and kind of in the middle of this very sudden change in color from, from red to blue. It does make the most intense spiking look sort of poppy and, and jump out, but it's not really representing to our brains the spike rate uh, in, as a continuous scale. Likewise, the HSV uses non-perceptually uniform, non-isoluminant colors. And again, you see these sort of apparent, very discrete jumps in color that aren't actually present in the data. And then, well, jet we saw before, an accent is absolutely terrible because it's not even gradations. It's got sort of discrete levels of color. So it creates these boundaries at different steps that we probably don't want. So to summarize, Heat maps allow us to visualize the relationship between three continuous variables using color to represent one of those variables. A heat map is effectively a 2D image and can be represented as a 2D NumPy array. We can save a pointer to a matplotlib image or image object that we create by assigning the result of generating the image to a variable name. And that's what we saw when we said im equals plt.imshow. These pointers can be used by other matplotlib commands, such as for creating color bars. 
So that's kind of the summary of things about creating the heat maps themselves. And then in terms of the sort of higher level considerations about choices of interpolation or color map, interpolation is the process of determining how to fill the missing values between data points for plotting smooth, continuous plots, such as heat maps. Different interpolation methods trade off between being more literal representations of the measured data or smoother looking representations based on fitting mathematical functions to the data. The choice of color scales and heat maps and other images is even more important than for other types of plots because nonlinear changes in hue, i.e. color or intensity, in other words, luminance, can trick the human eye and brain into seeing continuous data as more discontinuous. These kinds of distortions can interfere with correct interpretation of the data. And finally, it's best to use an isoluminant, perceptually uniform color scale when plotting continuous data, such as heat maps and other images. So that brings us to the end of today's lesson. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.